What is up, my friends, my friends, my friends? Welcome back to another day of the Daily Dose. We are coming with day number 248. Day 248. We are looking at Matthew today. We're looking at Matthew chapter 25 and chapter 26. And we also have Psalm 98 on the reading plan for today. Uh, we do not have any supplemental videos coming your way today, but if you do need to get a copy of the PDF guide that tells you the whole layout for the Bible reading plan that we're using, go click on the link in the description. You can get a copy of that PDF guide. So we're going to jump right into the scripture for today. <clears throat> okay, we start off with a number of parables, and I'm not going to go through the parables just because it would take too long. It would take way too long, right? I could preach multiple sermons on each parable if I had to. So I've just picked out a few select sections to talk about and highlight today. Um, but I'll go over all of the, the summary bullet points as well. So first we have a parable of ten virgins. Then there's a parable about bags of gold. Okay, then we've got a section that talks about the sheeps and the goats. Excuse me, the sheeps. The sheep and the goats. And then we get to a section that talks about the plot against Jesus, okay? And here it says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the place of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, okay? They schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, <clears throat> they said, or there might be a riot among the people. So notice, they're trying to, they're trying to scheme to, cap, to capture Jesus, and to find a way to get him killed, but they're also trying to do it without disturbing the people and causing a riot. Because if they do, if they cause a big uproar, um, you know, they, they were able to, they had a certain degree of sovereignty in their nation, right? They were able to practice their religion as they chose. They were able to, um, to fulfill most of their laws, most of them, um, to, to inflict their own justice and judgment for the most part. Um, so they had a certain degree of sovereignty, but they were still under Roman rule, okay? And there would be a, a, Roman, a Roman governor that was over them. And if something were to happen, like if a riot broke out, or if there was some big uproar, right, um, the Roman governor would be the one that's in charge that would have to answer to Caesar for what happened, right? <clears throat> and so the Jews did not want to get... Uh, the Romans involved any more than they had to be at this point, I think is part of the reason why they did this. Um, and they also didn't want to stir up a revolt because then Jesus might get away possibly, um, and they may not be able to roll out their whole plan, okay? Then we come to a section where Jesus is anointed at Bethany, okay? Um, and this is interesting, right? <clears throat> this woman pours out precious perfume. But there's a few instances where something similar to this happens. So I looked up a commentary and, and found a little bit more information to help us clarify things when it comes to <clears throat> um, Jesus being anointed. So here's what I found. It says, in each account, I think there's three, a woman pours out a precious and costly perfume in an extravagant act of worship. The three women who anointed Jesus recognized Christ's unequaled value and uh, express their gratitude with unreserved love and devotion, okay? Two anointings of Jesus happened during the week of Passover, and they are linked with his immediate death and burial. The earlier anointing, which we read about later in Luke's account, um, that's in the middle of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, and it draws a different lesson on forgiveness and love, okay? So there's three instances where Jesus gets anointed by women. <clears throat> Two, leading up to his death, right there shortly before his death, and then one further back during around the middle of his ministry. In each case, the woman's actions signal more than she knows, but although she may not fully comprehend the messianic significance of her anointing, each woman had come to appreciate Christ's worth more than anyone else at the table. Okay? <clears throat> and I've also read that this perfume they're talking about, it was held in jars made of like precious stone, like alabaster, right? And I don't know how they did this, but apparently there wasn't normally like a stopper where you could just boop, pull the stopper out, pour some perfume and put it back in. I don't know why there wouldn't be. Um, you would think there would be, but apparently they sealed this stuff inside of a jar. So they would make a jar, get the oil in there, and then somehow like permanently seal the jar. And the only way to get to the perfume was... Psh, to bust the jar open, and then that's it. It's either all or nothing. You got to use it. And and 
the stuff was apparently super, super, super expensive. It was so expensive that people would usually um, decorate the perfume containers and make them look very ornate. And they would just sit them on a shelf in their home and basically just look at them because they didn't want to bust it open because it was so expensive. So then we come to a section that talks about Jesus agreeing, or excuse me, Jesus, Judas agreeing to betray Jesus, okay? And and this is interesting. We, If you've read the accounts of the Gospels, you know that Judas agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Um, but the, there's a reference to the 30 pieces of silver that we find in the Old Testament in a couple of places. So I looked up some commentaries, and here's some interesting stuff that I found, right? Another prophetic reference is found in the 30 pieces of silver given to Zechariah after his work as a shepherd. He went to the house of those he worked for and asked them to pay him what they thought he was worth. They gave him 30 pieces of silver, which he sarcastically calls a handsome price <clears throat> because it was such a small amount, right? So he's saying, look, give me, what I, give me what you owe me for all this work that I've done, Zechariah. And they said, okay, we'll give you what you're worth. And they give him this amount that compared to the work he did, it was a pretty piddly amount. And he's like, oh, that's a handsome price, right? <clears throat> this happened to also be the price that was paid for a slave's accidental death, right? So like if you had an ox and the ox gored a slave or something like that, you know, and, <clears throat> and a slave was killed on accident um, by one of your animals, right? Um, the, the, the person who owned that animal would be responsible for paying the slave's owner 30 pieces of silver. So that's kind of another reference to what 30 pieces of silver used to be used for. Um, so anyways, it says that the employer's meant to insult Zechariah with this amount of money, right? It was meant to be a diss. It was meant to be an insult. They were throwing salt. They were throwing shade for any of you millennials out there, okay? Returning the insult, God tells Zechariah to throw it to the potter, right? And Zechariah tossed the money into the house of the Lord to be given to the potter, okay? So here we see Zechariah, based on what God's instructions, based on what God's telling him to do, he tosses the 30 pieces of silver into the temple, right? Just psh, tosses them in there to be used by the potter, okay? Now, this is interesting, <clears throat> Uh, this commentary goes on to say these actions are shockingly accurate and detailed prophecy. For when Judas bargained with the leaders of Israel to betray the Lord Jesus, he asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? The murderous cabal then counted out for Judas 30 pieces of silver, right? That is all they considered him to be worth. So just like um, the, the people that Zechariah was working for, he did all kinds of work. But the people that were in charge only thought he was worth 30 pieces of silver. Not much, right? Same thing's happening here. Judas is basically saying, hey, how much is Jesus worth to you? What do you got to give me for me to give him to you? You know, how, how's that going to work? What are you willing to pay? And they're like, eh, 30 pieces of silver, right? Which apparently, again, in the grand scheme of things, wasn't much. So, um... Uh, da -da -da -da. <clears throat> okay, later... After that, Judas was overcome with guilt for betraying Jesus, okay? And fulfilling Zechariah's vivid prophecy, he threw his 30 pieces of silver into the temple. And what happened with those 30 pieces of silver? The Jewish leaders used it to buy a field from a potter, right? And again, Zechariah basically predicted that. So that's very interesting. Um, Zechariah acting out something that was, in a sense, a very real sense, a prediction, a prophecy of what was going to happen to Jesus when he came along. So I didn't know that until I read this, this uh, commentary. Very interesting. And it was in that field that the Jewish leaders had purchased that Judas ultimately went and hung himself. Uh, so then we go on to a section about the Last Supper. Uh, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Uh, then we move on to Gethsemane. Um, Jesus gets arrested. And then Jesus has to stand before the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> and then when all that's going down, Peter is kind of creeping around, around the outside of where the Sanhedrin's meeting. And people come up to him and they're like, hey, aren't you with Jesus? And he's like, no, I don't know Jesus. Get, what, what are you talking about? I don't know Jesus. And Peter famously, or infamously, I should say, uh, denies Jesus three times. But that's all we've got time for today, friends. 
but I hope that you found that little bit interesting about Judas and the 30 pieces of silver because I know I did. But hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you. Love you guys. And hey, until we meet again, we'll do it again tomorrow. Deuces.